Good day. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here in my condo. We have a panel of experts that come from various sectors, and I, I know that we'll have a very interesting uh, session. You can answer in the the language of your choice. I introduce Melanie Robert. Hi, I'm pleased to be here. Microsoft Canada's strategic policy and technology efforts. He helps individuals and organizations across Canada innovate with technology while avoiding unintended consequences. He leads Canadian outreach for a variety of technology policies. He also leads Microsoft Canada's responsible AI program. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Stephanie Jacquois is the co-founder of the nonprofit organization Technovation Montréal, the Montreal chapter of the Technovation program, an international competition for the creation of mobile applications aimed at developing skills in technology and entrepreneurship in girls aged 10 to 18. In 2020, she co-founded Origin Village, whose mission is to remedy the chronic economic disparity in Afro-descendant communities. At the same time, Stephanie brings her passion to her work at the city of Montreal. Bonjour, Stephanie. Bonjour. And finally, Jean-Noël Landry is an Obama scholar with the Obama Foundation. He's a social entrepreneur who uses innovative data and technology solutions to build initiatives that redefine power relations among city stakeholders. Between 2015 and 2021, Jean-Noël served as the executive director of Open North, an organization that advises communities and governments of all sizes, including the Canadian government, on data strategies and literacy. Bonjour, Jean-Noël. Hi, everybody. So, Jean-Louis, uh, let me start with you. Where are we today with open data compared to 10 years ago, and why 10 years on is open data as relevant uh, today as it was then? Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, it's obviously a big question to answer in a kind of short panel like this one. Um, I think it's uh, we could even go further than 10 years, you know, if we really wanted to retrace the origins of the open data community. But my initial response would really be to that question. It's kind of the more the more things change, the more they stay the same, at least to some extent, you know, maybe to put it that way. So even with the mainstreaming of open data, with many governments adopting open open data policies and integrating open data into their kind of city plans or even government plans and services, uh, even different strategies, we still face fundamental questions that you know we've been facing for quite some time, like publishing with purpose versus opening uh, data by default, or why not both? So governments still expect to see a return on their investment. That's always the, the case because, you know, they're dealing with kind of limited resources and got to kind of, you know, uh, ascertain and kind of justify those uh, those costs. At the same time, they also need to engage a diversity of different types of data users to make open uh, data relevant to uh, to them. So to go to them and to uh, develop new strategies there. Um, so I think the, the difference is that we have many leaders uh, that are involved into, into this that we didn't necessarily see uh, kind of earlier on in the open data community. Um, but open data definitely remains relevant because our world is becoming more complex and technology and data uh, more ubiquitous in our lives. And since we need to understand the world, you know, as we'll always need to, um, and inform the way that we can mobilize limited resources, and addressing those problems, data and open data will still be relevant. I think a more critical lens on the open data movement says that, you know, so-called kind of first wave advocates were a bit naive, maybe too optimistic, maybe they drank the Kool-Aid too much, you know, look for kind of short term kind of like focus. Um, but, you know, we know now that, uh, you know, maybe they weren't looking at, you know, issues around kind of digital inclusion or digital rights, um, you know, that are now currently at front and center in contemporary data and data and tech uh, conversations, especially in the context of reconciliation, reconciliation anti-racism, ethical AI, surveillance capitalism, and, and whatnot. And lastly, I think I'd just say, you know, open data advocates have to confront, you know, the political and power dynamics of, the, of its discourse and assume a share of responsibility uh, as well in doing so. We hold power. We have agency uh, by virtue of, you know, who we are as a community and the types of skills and knowledge that we have. So that also means that organizations have changed over the last 10 years. And if you just take Open North, the organization that I used to lead, starting from a civic tech startup to what it is today with a focus and a mission driven towards the ethical and responsible use of data 
and technology, you see kind of how the open data uh, community has also shifted in the way that Open North has responded to uh, to that. Um, and there's been reports that I can share in the chat that kind of captures the last 10 years, but I'll stop there. Okay, we'll follow along with the chat. And I should say, if, uh, if our other panelists want to jump in at any time, please uh, feel free to do so. Thanks for that, Jean Noé. Uh, Melanie, this one's for you. La dernière année et demie a été une période. The last year was a year of uh, learning on all of France. What have you learned about open data within federal government? Well, I think that the pandemic was a break. Uh, uh, by this, I mean that whether we're civil servants or not, we we ended up at home and we needed information and we needed to feel that we could trust our governments. And as a citizen, we wanted information, we wanted more, we wanted data, and we all turned towards the trackers that, that were created. So open data and the sharing of data, that was something theoretical for many people. And all of a sudden, it became something very concrete. So it's very important, I think, uh, for the movement of open data because uh, we realize it's important. At the same time, we realize how difficult it is to put out the data. There was a lot of goodwill uh, left and right and center, but even then uh, it was revealed what was revealed was our level of immaturity, not just in Canada, but in the world as regards the potential of data. So the fact that we had data that were not uh, quality data, they were not standardized, uh, we couldn't compare them. There were offers of help uh, uh, from the various corners and we couldn't agree. And that's very important because uh, that made the the uh, players in this ecosystem to the importance of open data to manage crises, to uh, to c come through a crisis, and all the challenges that we will have to face and that go beyond the open data community. I think that's important. We learned a lot, and we have still a lot to, to learn about uh, the pandemic. Merci, Melanie. Uh, Stéphanie, uh, speaking of concrete learnings, uh, what inspiring project came out of Innovation Montréal? Are there any applications, projects with concrete impacts that have been powered by open data in particular? Yes, certainly. Um, our mission is really to empower uh, and train and provide tools for um, the next generation of women in STEM. And so uh, by giving them a real opportunity to put their skills into actions. And so um, so through our program, they learn how to create a mobile app that will uh, solve a problem in their community. And so, um, and so they learn how to leverage technology to tackle global issues and solve real world problems. And then we saw with the pandemic um, that uh, some of the issues that the teams wanted to tackle was domestic violence. Um, because they've done some research and saw that women are three times more likely than men uh, to have been assaulted in their lifetime. So um, there was one team who started to work on a mobile app called Safe Away. And they, the, um, the, app, um, the, the aim of the app is to help women uh, users to find a safer route for their itinerary based on um, data that is shared by the community. So based on the information given by the users of this app, um, so they could find what is the best um, itinerary to go from point A to point B. And that was interesting because the app also allow users to rate those itineraries. So it was interesting that, you know, from this, this app, this tool that they're using that um, the women could feel safe and know exactly where to, um, which road, road to take to go from one point to one B. And when they were doing their um, comparison with, um, with the competition, you know, they would say, well, Google Maps or Waze, you know, would um, project the short the shorter or the fastest way, but then their app would provide them the safest way. So, um, so that was a, that's a good example. I think that you know that 
see how um, you know, the young people can use those data and, and how to and to to solve a problem in their community. And also based on domestic violence and also on um, um, those issues, there was another app also that another team created, um, which also addressed the topic of domestic abuse. And this one was really to help women that are victim of uh, domestic abuse to escape their toxic environment. Um, and so to provide a data about um, using geolocation and where to find the um, the the the, the um, to find the place that is the, the closer to their home, where they could find um, resources and where they could find shelter, and they use a decoy so this way that people could you know if you know their partners or the, the people that were closer that they were um, in conflict with would not see that information. And again, um, the the user, the community, the the, the people who use this um, app could be um, also provide information to to grow the data and be and help those women who were in those situations. Wow, and it sounds like they were actually applying um, a critical lens to looking at the existing technologies out there like Google Maps and Waze and, and applying sort of critical thinking to, to what are the mainstream tools offering and what do we need to offer uh, instead. That's fascinating. Um, thank you. Uh, John, next one for you. These projects, obviously, that Stephanie was talking about, they're great for learning and developing skills in young people, which, of course, is essential. But can you talk a little bit about what we need to do if we want to open data to sort of beyond hackathons and prototypes to uh, bigger scale projects with concrete impacts? Yeah, certainly, Nora. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, I'll, I'll tie this a little bit into what uh, Jean Noé was saying a little bit earlier on around um, this uh, field of dreams almost approach to uh, publishing data, or perhaps even suggesting that you know people went at it from uh, almost a a romantic approach to say, hey, if we open up this data, people will come. Um, it's important to look back at the past ten years and understand what's happened so far, uh, and be able to pivot or re-anchor on these thoughts because often we as people we uh, keep the the past in mind. We use dated frames of reference. Uh, and so it's important that we take a look at, you know, what successes have been made, but put those in the proper context. Perhaps uh, we need a new measurement scheme uh, instead of simply measuring the number of data sets that have been put out there or the number of apps that are out there. Uh, perhaps we need to look at the impact or the effectiveness of those tools. I, I think as well, uh, and jean Noé alluded to this as well, uh, is to publish with, for purpose. Uh, where we've seen success in opening up data and having these data uh, sharing uh, type uh, approaches, uh, it's having those concrete use cases and really being crisp around, around how this data might be used for the benefit of Canadians or benefit of our, our global uh, our global family. Uh, and even when we have com um, compelling use cases, uh, and I think about the many interactions that industry had with uh, municipal, provincial and federal governments we're looking to roll up our sleeves to help with the pandemic, uh, we simply didn't get to a point where we could say, here's a concrete use case to do that. Uh, and in even perhaps more controversial or more, um, I think, um, uh, something to ponder is, you know, do we need to rethink how we look at data? You know, if we look at the past 10 years, there's a lot of uh, uh, information and a lot of data that's been shared that's, you know, tabular data or static data. But we're in a data-rich environment and we have Internet of Things and we have other sensors. So there's streaming data. We need to consider the temporal aspects of data uh, and perhaps even data sheets for data. I think it boils down to really three things, uh, maintaining and growing those principles that we have for data uh, and open data. Uh, it's really putting together those collaborations and putting our foot forward to say, you know, we will work together, uh, civil society, government, industry, to really make the most value out of data. Uh, and then finally, I think it's around putting the tools in place uh, and getting tooling in place to make it easier for people to uh, consume the data uh, and make uh, useful use cases of it. And just to follow up on that, um, how should we be thinking about the way we see this sort of data ecosystem? Like, what does it mean to see data on a kind of spectrum as opposed to just a dichotomy between open and closed? Yeah, you know, I, I think when we start to look at uh, some of the policymakers or some of the tools that are out there, um, again, we think of an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV type uh, uh, type data, and, and we really need to look at it uh, in a more broad fashion. You know, one of the great learnings I've had over the last uh, few years is uh, being involved with the innovation super clusters, which is the government's uh, 900 million, close to a billion dollars of matching funds to help grow innovation across five key clusters. And that's the Oceans Cluster, uh, that's AI-enabled supply chain, advanced manufacturing, proteins-based innovation, and digital tech. Uh, and the idea is to foster innovations to float all boats for innovation across those sectors. So where can you build something that's going to help everybody in the community? 
Uh, and so we had this idea about creating a digital twin, a fully digital representation of the Bay of Fundy. Because uh, our sense was that, look, the Bay of Fundy is a geographically unique location around the world, uh, and it's going to really have a huge economic impact on the region. Uh, and so if we could create this digital twin, then that would have value, not only for uh, the students, uh, educational purposes, but also for people in that community. Uh, and so we started to look at, well, what degree of resolution is required? Perhaps students would be comfortable with a, a, a Minecraft style view of, uh, of the Bay of Fundy, but that wouldn't be good enough for shipping uh, and uh, mobility across the Bay. They'd need more accuracy. Uh, and so would that be a subscription model or a collaborative model? Uh, and then if you have a water turbine that's generating energy at the bottom of the Bay, well, one meter resolution wouldn't be good enough if you're sending divers into those huge tides. Uh, and so maybe you need one centimeter resolution. Uh, and so looking at that continuum, there are some areas where we may consider having free and open data. And there may be others where we have different business models that support the use of, uh, of these innovative tools. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to chime in on that idea of this sort of spectrum of data between open and closed? We're all being very, <laughs> very polite. <laughs> so no, I think, I think I think it's great. I think there used to be when we started this dichotomy, like either data was closed or it was open and then it was mixed with ethics and ethics meaning you're protecting or so you're closing. And so I think it's really interesting that more and more we're, we're talking also about, um, you know, it's not it, it doesn't have to be fully closed or fully open. There's a continuum and there should be somewhere shared data with permissions with specific for specific use and so we're starting to be more comfortable talking about this and having the tools to actually uh, to actually execute on this and obviously we need to develop also the principles around it but i think it's going to be a, a lot a much healthier conversation if we if we stop talking about open or close but talk about this continuum Maybe, maybe just to build on that, I mean, I think it's also looking at the spectrum, a way to um, engage and manage a process in a way that enables you to name kind of perceived and real risks and kind of build confidence, you know, within a group of stakeholders to kind of say, okay, this is who we are. How do you situate your own comfort level in making data accessible that you may not have, you know, done so in the past and kind of being explicit about it and making that visible in a spectrum is a, is a much easier to manage than you know that kind of daunting kind of like jump into the kind of the void of like openness and see what happened and all the unknowns that come along with that so you know from a practitioner's perspective that's a tool that i've used quite a lot as an approach mm -hmm. Uh, Stéphanie, next question for you. Uh, quels sont les grands défis auxquels les nouvelles générations What are the major challenges facing new generations to start new projects? And how can open data help them overcome obstacles that might hold youth back from participating? Well, I think the first thing is to equip youth with the tools to understand how they can solve problems and understand problems in society. So first, they need access to platforms, platforms that will allow them to communicate with different civil society stakeholders and be able to express their ideas. I think mentorship is also huge, helping these youth to understand how they can develop their projects. There's a, there have been certain initiatives like Cooperaton, which are experiences that might be more practical or more theoretical, but this type of initiative allows youth to see what the major issues are and work in cooperation and collaboration. Certain experiences can also help young people become more competitive. And it's always important for them to be able to express their opinion and their voice. Because people also want to know what young people's concerns are, whether it be regarding climate change or other issues. We know that youth bring so much to the table, whether it be talking about their concerns or their ideas for solutions. So it's very helpful for them to be able to make exchanges on different platforms. 
So by creating this type of experience, letting youth have access to uh, data, that is very beneficial. And the youth also need to be trained in how to use the data. We all know there are a lot of uh, issues around confidentiality, and youth need to know how to protect themselves against potential risks. Inaudible for the interpreter. Uh, Jean-Noé, uh, how should leadership change in the open data community so that it continues to stay relevant? And how do we make the open data community more inclusive? Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think and just to build on what was just being said right now, I mean, I think we've certainly seen a, a shift in, in di diversification of the open data community's uh, leadership model. Um, I think just the fact that, you know, CODS, you know, 21 is you're making uh, its comeback as a demonstration of the uh, kind of open data communities kind of vitality, uh, strength, uh, diversity and prof professionalization as well. Um, if you, you know, anybody who takes a look at the program will kind of see that it's in fact a, a community of communities, right? So I think we kind of need to kind of embrace and kind of recognize that diversity. But from, a, from my experience, I mean, I think the open data community is at its best and, and most impactful when it stays ahead, uh, when it engages, you know, resourcefully and constructively and empathizes with people who feel kind of maybe stuck. You know, and it can, to enable that innovation or to kind of have a different kind of conversation and to enable them to have conversations with folks in, inside maybe a public administration that don't have the language to kind of make the case for uh, open data. It's really in our, um, you know, in our DNA, so to speak, to, to kind of think in terms of like mindset or systems uh, shifts. And from open data requires us to kind of mediate or negotiate and define problems. So if you look at, you know, different kind of, uh, you know, sectors or other communities that, you know, are, you know, very data focused, uh, like the climate change community, and you look at the analysis of like, you know, participants at like major conferences, when they talk about, you know, how do we activate the commitments on, um, you know, climate change and all this kind of bold stuff that governments are committed to doing. And you look at the kind of the, uh, the type of kind of transformational skills that are required, and that they're looking for, they'll speak about Openness, self-awareness, reflection, compassion, empathy, agency, empowerment, values-based courage, engagement. That's the open data community that I know. And I think it's really up to us to kind of name, you know, and recognize kind of ourselves fully in our abilities to really kind of exercise change and kind of reach out and, you know, put our, our, our good skills to work in other sectors. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Stephanie, do you have things that you'd like to add to this? Yes, um, actually, uh, when we speak about diversity, I think that we've seen with the, in the pandemic, um, when, you know, people were saying, well, how can we find data about, you know, um, you know, people who are maybe affected with COVID-19 and, you know, and, and we realize that um, a lot of communities and we talk about diversity communities, maybe um, in, in some areas, uh, people who wouldn't have access to those information. I think that it's important to work with local organizations and, 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 and that maybe are on the ground and that knows their community and know where to reach people. Because I think that when we talk about open data, there's probably a lot of people from different communities that don't have access, who don't even know, you know, what we're talking about. And, 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 and we need those information. We know we need so data. And we saw how crucial it was when it was to reach out to those um, grassroots organizations to be able to speak directly to the people in their communities and, and be able to provide those information. Um, and, and we saw that also, um, as I mentioned, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the work that we do with, with black entrepreneurs, um, when we saw, you know, the, um, the, the, the situation uh, with, you know, the death of George Floyd and everybody started to um, find an interest about how can we support black uh, communities, how can we support black uh, companies. And then we, were, we started to research on what is the purchasing power of the black communities and what are the data of uh, people who consume about, you know, black uh, products. And we couldn't find those data. They're not available. So I think that um, there's probably a lot of work that needs to be done to how we can reach out to those different communities and work with them. Uh, local um, local organizations that are on the ground. Anyone else want to chime in on the, the leadership and uh, diversity and inclusion question? 
Yeah, I, I'm gonna, I wanted to keep it for, for some of the last question, but this is really good. I think that, I think we, we I hope that we all come out of this, um, this conference thinking about what Stephanie just said and how we can help through our, uh, whatever we do in the open data world to reach out to communities who may not know about open data and may not know how data can help them um, understand issues that they're facing, but also look at solutions because that, that point is not always obvious. And I think it's on us to do that a lot more. Thank you for that. Uh, Melanie, I'd like to follow uh, up with you. From your perch with the national government, you have sort of a unique perspective. You can see everything that's happening from coast to coast to coast. So what's your perspective on the state of open data across Canada? Yes, and I, I think it, it may uh, not always feel like this, but I have to say Canada, and when I include the provinces and the territories and the, and the cities, we're actually seen as a global leader, I don't. I know it doesn't always feel like it, but really we've been at it. Like in Canada, the first data portal was created in 2011, 2012, and there's been steady progress ever since. Um, and just in 2018, Canada was ranked number one in the world, uh, tied with UK for in the global open data barometer. And we more recently, we, we were ranked in the top five in the world uh, under the OECD. So we're quite good. Um, and we have a lot of provinces that already have their own data portal or assessing the opportunity, how to create it. So I think we're better than we think in some ways. But also, um, there's pockets everywhere uh, of, of people who have never heard about open data. And the level of maturity amongst the jurisdiction, amongst each jurisdiction, is very mixed. So within each government, there's areas and pockets that are not advanced, don't really have the resources, don't really understand how it works. Um, so we haven't fully reached the potential of open data because our level of maturity even if we are leading worldwide, it's still kind of immature. This is still a new thing. Um, so I think the last piece where I, I think we're not as good as we'd like to be, and I think this is globally, is understanding the power of open data and the difference it makes. And I think John made that point, and so did John away. Like, so what? What happens to this data? What are we doing with it? Um, how can we explain what happens when data sets are reused and, and well shaped so that people can innovate with it or solve issues? So, so that's my, in, in a nutshell, we're up there with the best. It's mixed. We have a lot of work uh, to do to improve. And we collectively, this community needs to do more work to talk to other communities about the benefits of open data and explain what can be done with it and the power of it and, and try to even try to count uh, the use of open data and the difference it makes. Thank you for that. John, I wonder if you would like to jump in on this since you have the perspective uh, from your work with uh, Microsoft Canada. Yeah, so I'd uh, echo what Melanie had, had mentioned around the different uh, stages of maturity and uh, different levels of uh, of engagement uh, with that, and we see uh, some healthy competition amongst uh, amongst community members. Uh, I think uh, what's also interesting is to see uh, some of the data sharing. And so while we uh, often talk solely about open data, uh, we have an increasing number of uh, organizations that are sharing data amongst uh, communities. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit later around uh, when we start to talk about some of the collectives or, or data sharing uh, uh, communities that are there. Uh, and so there's great leading work there. Uh, I just ha happened to come across an article earlier today uh, that talked about what Estonia is doing. And of course, Estonia is always used as, a, as an example for e-government and uh, their advanced thinking in this area. Uh, and they've actually taken a step to provide additional tools and almost a platform to help people with uh, with the open data. And I know that uh, our, our federal government um, is uh, has close ties, uh, not ties, but close connections with the CIO over in uh, Estonia uh, and le learning the lessons and moving forward together. And so I think, you know, looking at the international scene uh, and then continuing to challenge ourselves to uh, uh, be typically not Canadian and take the lead, uh, I think will stand us in good stead. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Jean-Louis, quels sont les problèmes sociaux environnementaux? Jean-Louis, what are the uh, economic, the urgent economic and environmental issues that you think open data can have a real impact for 
Service will resume as soon as sound quality permits. I would add that we're hearing more and more about uh, fake news, disinformation, misinformation. And open data could be an important tool in the fight against those things. It's important for people to be able to understand the context around that data. And once that is achieved, it will be easier to explain situations to people and to journalists. It's important to be able to get the data out there, but also explain where it came from. Mm -hmm. 
uh, more transparent uh, and accountable to kind of decisions that are made that are not necessarily visible to users of data. And so, you know, John mentioned like, you know, hitting the wall when you're trying to access data. It's also about kind of being able to understand what's the kind of decision making process that led to the release of that data set or maybe data sets that were not released to build trust and to build confidence. Because I think the argument that Minani is also making is a fundamental kind of like democratic argument, you know, and how open data situates itself within the kind of social contract and the relationship between citizens and their public institutions. So making that risk assessment around data uh, kind of audits and what we see and what we don't see can really serve as a kind of a lever of engagement. And I think we're, we're there now, but we need to empower those data stewards within public administrations to kind of build that confidence and that trust in them and support them, you know, when they get kind of put on the spot. But I think that that would be another measure that we haven't seen so far. Well, and then to build on that further, you know, what some of the conversations we're having with uh, uh, some of those uh, entities that uh, the public has lost uh, faith in, uh, the crisis of trust that we're, uh, we're experiencing with many of these institutions, um, they're looking very hard at how they use these modern tools uh, in order to provide that transparency. Uh, and so when we talk about the use of uh, artificial intelligence to help with client service, you know, that's all fine and well, but uh, there are conversations underway around saying, hey, how do I use AI to provide greater transparency of what's happening? inside and then build that trust and confidence for that service delivery out there. So really some invigorating conversations that are happening. Now it's trying to get to action. Mm. I, I want to just follow up a little bit, uh, John, shift the ground to sort of new trends and technologies and opportunities on the horizon and what you see as their impacts on uh, open data. You know, that's a, that's a great question. And, and the penny really only dropped for me uh, during this call that, uh, hey, 10 years ago was the early days of cloud computing uh, and making sure that people have this uh, ubiquitous access to computing resources. Uh, and so really I see three things that are happening in this regard. Uh, I think the first is around governance, the second is around technology, and the third is around democratization. Uh, if I were to click into a little bit uh, further, you know, we see a lot of governance uh, work being done in governance uh, around data trusts or data collaboratives or data collectives. Uh, and and setting the play, setting the stage for you know how people will interact using data, uh, and so you know health providers that are doing research can set up the rules to do that or publication of these tools. Uh, we've seen uh, great work that's being done on data sheets for data uh, and for data sets, so that you can describe the data. So people are wrapping their head around what it means to. Uh, own this data uh, or, or safeguard this data and then to share it onwards. Uh, on the uh, tool side of the house, man, there are so many really, really cool tools. Uh, so cloud computing is just the first one, but uh, differential privacy, data perturbation, synthetic data. And you know these are things that are invented in Canada, which is so cool. Um, confidential computing, machine learning, these things are uh, really helping us change that conversation so that we can deflate the elephant in the room that always comes in with open data around PII, uh, even when we're not dealing with personal identifiable information. Uh, and then on the near horizon, and this is anywhere from five to 10 years out, quantum computing. Uh, and so we talked about some of these big challenges that open data can help us with. You know, when we think about health, when we think about the environment, when we think about, you know, energy, you know, th that quantum computing is, is just almost there. And so we need to think about these things as we, uh, as we think about the new policy frameworks. The last piece is around democratization of tools. Uh, and, you know, every time I say that, uh, I feel like a marketer, uh, but it's really making this stuff silly, simple to use, right? Uh, and we think about the early days of the spreadsheet uh, and, you know, how they were complicated and was only in accounting. I think all of us now know how to create a table in uh, in our favorite spreadsheet uh, um, application, which which is Excel, right? Uh, but, you know, that, that part of it, <laughs> well, we see democratization of these tools uh, for artificial intelligence uh, built in so that you can simply make use of it and have a what-if exploration. Or another advancement is called low code, no code. Uh, and so almost using a Lego brick approach to connect data sets and reason over that data so that everybody that has a passion for this, which this community has, doesn't need to be a developer. It can simply put their ideas and light them up using the right data. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie, you look like you, you wanted to jump in there. Um, I think when you talked about democratization, I think it was um, for me was a, a keyword because we've seen that um, you know giving access to those tools. But what do, what do you do to populations who don't have access to internet or don't have access to those technology? Um, I think it, it's so key um, to 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 be able to to have access to, as you said, low code, no code. Because uh, when when we work with the, the younger people, we can see. Um, 
some of them who lives in maybe underserved areas who don't have necessarily those access, but we still feel that it's so critical and important for them to, to learn about those tools and to be able to use them. Um, so um, I think democratization and giving access to the, the a, a, big, a larger number is, is so critical uh, right now. Mm -hmm. I just want to follow up a little bit with uh, Jean Noé. Do you see uh, ethical and or privacy concerns around machine learning and open data? I do, but I'm still stuck on data literacy. So, you know, for, for me, like when we talk about all this innovation and all these things that are that are kind of coming up, um, you know, for, for me and maybe to kind of take a, a bit of a higher level kind of like analysis on this, it's like, uh, you know, John mentioned the uh, kind of the emphasis on governance. So it's like, for me, it's looking at, um, you know, the overlap or the distinctiveness between different sets of governance principles, whether it's democratic governance, whether it's like governance of technology and the, the governance of, uh, of data itself, um, and how really kind of really kind of create uh, kind of, um, you know, enabling conditions for, you know, all, as well as the specific comments, as well as the data comments to be able to, you know, benefit from uh, the release and the sharing and the collaborativeness of, of data. So that, that kind of like governance lens, I think, is a really, really important one. Um, and that applies to, uh, uh, you know, what, what we know is, is happening in the AI uh, and machine learning uh, space, because who governs, who controls, who has oversight, who's accountable, what are the transparency kind of mechanisms, um, who's going to be able to influence and monitor and report back um, to able to uh, kind of inform the way that algorithms are, are modified um, and, and learn who's doing the learning. Um, so really kind of opening up that, that black box, which I'm sure has been mentioned several times during uh, kind of other panels. And that would, you know, a, a good example that I find quite interesting just to kind of make that the democratic aspect of kind of surveillance of these algorithms concrete um, is the city of um, of Seattle, uh, who put in place a surveillance ordinance, uh, whereby you have uh, surveillance, uh, sorry, a master list of surveillance technologies, as well as surveillance impact uh, report stages. So it's really about integrating different types of, you know, values, as well as principles into technological systems to kind of build up that accountability and transparency as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stephanie, can we take advantage of these new technologies to prepare the next generation? Like what skills are essential for young entrepreneurs so they can thrive in a world where, as we know, data and digital are such a critical part of our lives? And how can open data support their, their learning journey? Well, I think that digital literacy is certainly key. Um, I remember that there was a, um, a study that was uh, published a few years ago by that Dell Technology that was saying that 85% of the jobs that will exist in, in 2030 haven't even been invented yet. And so if we want to prepare this the, the future generation to be able to be competitive on the market, to, to just be able to 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 create those to to have them um, to give them opportunities for the future. Definitely, I think digital literacy is, is very important. Um, help them also develop develop their critical thinking. Um, also, becoming problem solvers um, and 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 working that with when I was mentioning like co development and peer to peer um, support is also I think very important. And and when we talk about data, I think that just understanding um, what kind of usage they can do of, of those data. And, 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 and I think that we were talking earlier, how can you make sure that the data that you're using, is it, is it, is, is it good information? Um, um, how can you verify that information? So I think that there's a lot to go with education and, 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 um, and providing uh, those tools um, to our, the younger generation to be prepared in order to, to be able to be competitive. So, so I think that education Education is key, and, and learning about those tools and, and, and giving them access to those uh, to those information. Mm -hmm. And why is it important to focus on young women? Well, we know that only twenty percent of women are in the STEM industry, and and so um, and while we are fifty percent of the population, and so um, I think that exposing um, um, at a younger age um, um, women to what are the possibilities of career in technology, um, I just 
think it just opens up um, um, for them their horizon and see that you know there's so many different things that 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 can be done. Um, and I think that having role models, seeing women who are thriving in this industry, uh, being able to have access to those to those women and to be able to to learn from them, and and so that's why I think mentorship is also very key. Um, I think that's also bring a different perspective. Um, we've seen it in the, some of the project and the issues that um, um, some of the teams, the girls that we're working with are tackling. Um, you know, they, they bring those perspective and, and, and that is rooted in, you know, their um, understanding of, of some situations. And I think that it's interesting to see, you know, how they, they, they bring the, those solutions. Um, so definitely, I think that having um, those voices expressed and, and when we talk about women also, I think of women of that coming from diverse background also, which is very important. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a few of the ethical issues coming out of these considerations. Are there uh, are there additional ethical uh, concerns that we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to raise? Anybody? Okay. Well, I think just, Fair enough. Well, maybe just. I, I could take that. I mean, I think part of the ethical issues is understanding what the data says and what was the original intent of, of the data being collected. And I think the context, you know, of of the data is very, very important, which kind of brings us to, you know, whose job is it to demystify or decomplexify, you know, data, you know, in order to, um, you know, translate data into kind of actionable you know, uh, you know, initiatives or take action. I think that's that's something that we see in the the scientific community and some of the kind of attitude behavior gap. You know, for climate action, where you have huge amount of data, but then you know, scientists are, are recognizing very quickly, and I think that's happening right now. It's a live conversation that you know the the main challenge is to be able to kind of use that data ethically, responsibly, in order to facilitate, you know, climate action to happen on multiple scales while addressing the attention deficit of citizens from a, with a variety of scenarios. And that's that's really difficult to do, but it's happening and we kind of need to step up in order to, to do that. Um, so we need to, to mobilize and to create and, and sustain new decentralized kind of mitigation and ad adaptation like protocols using that data responsibly and ch having those checks and balances around how we inform ourselves to kind of act uh, you know, in a way that that is uh, that is useful. Otherwise, you know, at the end of the day, it becomes a an exercise in uh, you know com failed kind of uh, scientific uh, uh, communication, and the results can have you know a lot of like really significant impact. So the ethics is always at the forefront or at the center of you know everything that comes afterwards in terms of how society shapes itself and can benefit from data sources. I I think I'm going to add and and oh sorry, did you want to say something? Well, I, w I was just also um, wanted to mention that I think that the who's also who has access to that data and who's has um, um, who makes it available. Also, I think it's is something that we need to look at when we we talk about the bias, um, you know, in AI, where you know um, if we don't have. Um, um, a definite set of data that, you know, for specific communities, groups, or, um, you, you know, those things we know that, you know, can ha have potentially uh, bring bias. So I think that also um, when we talk about education, so it's also to bring as much as possible dif a diversity also in the people who have those data that pro release those data. So um, I think that's also something that we, we need to um, put a focus on. I, I just wanted to go uh, to, to go back to some earlier comments from Stephanie and, and John the way on literacy and go very grassroots and talk about I, I think there's a lot of public servants that are realizing, oh my God, I'm a data steward. I, I have I have in my power like I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to protect this data, curate this data, use this data. It's as if you inherited the box of gold coin from Uncle Joe and you're just now realizing the value of what you have. And I think what's really interesting, and we're seeing it, is uh, th there's now like a lot of uh, demand for training. Our, our Canada School of Public Service has developed a lot of training around data, and the uh, the, the the new employees and the up and comers are are taking in this training because they want to get literate and understand. And I think the first step is is really like probably very technical and making sure that you know you 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 tag your data and you save it properly, but as you get more mature, then the questions of ethics uh, can come and you will be better equipped with it. So I, I'm also a strong believer in this need to really go broadly and, and look at, you know, help people get uh, literate on, on data. 
Well, and, and to follow up on that, it's actually to use the data. So it's not just the literacy part, but it's actually learned by doing. Uh, and so not to shy away from it. I, I, I worry that when people talk about data being the new oil, which is a horrible metaphor in my mind, uh, you know, it's just, you know, people hoard it and will start to guard it. And really what, uh, what we've learned through our work on responsible AI is, you know, as uh, Stephanie was saying, having diverse opinions and, and diverse perspectives from across ethnicities, gender, orientation, uh, regions locale has always given us a better insight into how to use that data. Uh, and it's really then highlighted the need, uh, as Jean Noé was saying, is to contextualize the data, right? So, and, and that's where data sheets for data come in. Under what circumstances was the data collected? What are the time frames? What's the accuracy? Uh, so that you have that sense, because that's where it all starts. Uh, and then to look across the principles that are widely adopted around the world, around fairness, around safety and privacy, uh, around uh, uh, reliability, uh, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability and then start to figure out what this does because some of the early projects that we reviewed on my responsible AI team, we would have had a different uh, uh, determination these days. Uh, and the last piece to worry about is uh, this this thing that's creeping into the marketplace and we've seen it through deep, deep fakes and others is adversarial AI. So people are poking our data, and poking our AI uh, and trying to figure out how does it work behind the scenes to try to gain uh, advantage from it? Uh, and so we need to take those lessons learned that we have from the cybersecurity space and apply them to our data space as well and these new advanced technologies. Oh, thanks for that. I feel like I've, I wish I had a piece of paper here because I feel like I'm getting a lot of good story ideas for Spark from all of you. Um, so the last question is over to, to all of you actually, uh, each of you in turn. So what would you say to conference attendees as they go back to their jobs and communities? Que souhaitez-vous dire aux participants et participantes du sommet avant le retour au travail et dans le communauté? What do you have to tell the participants before they go back to work? the need to create and and really nourish this ecosystem that we have that we're seeing today at create this sense of community. There's a lot of people working in isolation around open data. And then to, to Stephanie's earlier point, um, connect with other communities uh, to actually be sure that, uh, you know, open data can have use and, and that other communities that are not uh, knowledgeable about, about open data can uh, start thinking about it, request it, and use it. I think another piece is really, we've got to get better at automating this, making it really easy, because it's still hard to publish open data. And so we, we each have our own way, and I think everyone in this audience have the means to make it easier somehow um, uh, through better standardization or quality, like technical aspects or policy aspects, but we all have a a, a, a way to help and make this kind of automated, obviously with a lot of checks from the get-go. But I think this is the key for this to really reap its benefit and 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 uh, reach the maturity that we want it to reach. I'll just pull pull a little bit on 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 the the keep the conversation going. Over the last two days, there's been a variety of very very stimulating, diverse uh, opinions uh, and insight that have been shared by the community. Uh, and so how do you keep that conversation going so that we can keep the energy up, like great energy in every one of the talks that uh, we've heard. Uh, and so we need to keep that energy going so that we can build out and make a difference uh, as we go forward. Stephanie, over to you. Yes, I think that, um, you know, bringing a, a bit more understanding of what it is, uh, and, and I think that what um, Melanie was just saying, I, I think that for me is is keys to reaching out to, you know, to be on the, uh, grassroots and, 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 and connecting also with even like the younger generations and, 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 and having um, those conversations outside of, of the community. I think that sometimes, you know, we, we tend to, you know, stay between between us and and just share this information but i think that you know to to go out and just you know find out about you know what are people are 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 doing and 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 they can understand why do they why that is, is is important and i think that you know just have this conversation but maybe outside you know outside of this community and just reach out to to um, to other people and to just have to start that conversation with with uh, different groups and different uh, um commun communities would be something that i think that we should have in mind john no last word to you 
And for, for me, I mean, I think the, the main maybe two takeaways is maybe, you know, we talk about, you know, how data can save lives, right? There's like a kind of a discourse around that. The argument is being made, but we need to also make the same argument for the open data community to step up to the moment and the types of challenges that are kind of our communities, our societies, our cities, you know, are also paying. So we think we have like more power than we give ourselves or, or that we recognize. And in recognizing that we, we need to do it in a way and exercise it in a way that's, that's responsible and ethical. And I think we've heard a lot of that over the, the last two days. And lastly, I think, you know, learning from the open access uh, lessons from, uh, from COVID or during the pandemic where, you know, scientists were kind of sharing preliminary results, you know, to accelerate the pace of innovation. So there's there's a lot that we can kind of learn from challenging the structures of, and, and control of data, information and, and knowledge and doing that also in an ethical way and a responsible way. I think it's something that I'm sure we can achieve. I want to thank you all very much, Melanie, John, Stephanie, and Jean Noé. It's been a super interesting and stimulating conversation. And I think we've given um, the attendees a lot to think about as they go back into their communities uh, and their work. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I think that we are turning things over to uh, Richard now.